Throughout the expansive history of Middle-earth, a myriad of weapons wielded by elves, humans, and dwarves have come into play. While a significant number of these were unremarkable and nameless, a select few stood apart. These unique weapons, remarkable in their own right and in the hands of equally extraordinary wielders, bore their own names. Their influence extended beyond battlefields, leaving indelible imprints on the annals of Middle-earth's history. Hello everyone and welcome to Middle-earth. I am your tale teller, Dragon. Today I'm going to talk about the famous weapons of Middle-earth, but because there are so many of them, in this video we will only look at the Second and Third Ages. Following the momentous events of the First Age of the Sun, the number of elves residing in Middle-earth significantly dwindled, with those remaining dispersed across the vast landscape. But still above them all was Gilgalad, whom they all counted and regarded as king, and indeed the last High King of Noldor. Gilgalad devoted the majority of his remaining years to combating the threat of Sauron. His weapon of choice was Iglos, translating to Icicle. Contrary to the common perception of Middle-earth's renowned weapons, Iglos was not a sword but a spear, an instrument of death in the skilled hands of Gilgalad. It is said that during the wars between the last alliance of elves and men and Sauron's forces, the mere sight of Gilgalad and Iglos instilled such dread in the orcs that they would flee in terror. This very weapon was utilized by Gilgalad in his fatal confrontation with Dark Lord. The fate of Iglos following Gilgalad's demise in this struggle remains a mystery. Although not a handheld weapon in the traditional sense, Grand undoubtedly warrants mention in any discussion of the Second and Third Ages' notable weaponry. Grand was a colossal battering ram employed by Sauron's army to dismantle the formidable gates of Minas Tirith during the siege of the city and the ensuing battle of the Pelennor Fields. The selection of the name Grand carries significant symbolism. Through this choice, Sauron pays homage to his former master, Melkor, despite his long elapsed absence. Melkor's renowned hammer, wielded in his duel against Fingolfin, also bore the name Grand. Constructed specifically for the aforementioned battle in the Forges of Mordor, the Third Age Grand was a 98 feet long battering ram, its apex crowned with an enormous wolf's head. From this wolf's maw erupted flames, and trolls were tasked with propelling it forward. It smashed the gate of Minas Tirith with a few blows, allowing the orcish army to enter the city. The fate of Grand following this decisive battle remains shrouded in uncertainty. Herugrim and Guthwina, both esteemed swords of Rohan, have their own unique histories. Herugrim served as the weapon of choice for generations of Rohan's kings. During the War of the Ring, the sword found itself distanced from its royal owner when Grima Wormtongue and Saruman seized control over King Theoden of Rohan. The king and his sword were later reunited by Gandalf, who broke the spell that had ensnared Theoden. In the critical battles at Helm's Deep and Minas Tirith, it was Herugrim that King Theoden brandished. Upon his death, it is plausible that the sword was passed to Aomer. Guthwina, on the other hand, was the named weapon of Aomer. He too wielded this sword in the pivotal clashes at Helm's Deep and Minas Tirith. However, further information regarding this sword remains elusive. The Daggers of Westerness, also known as Barrow Blades, may not bear individual names, yet their significance in Middle-earth's history is undeniable. These daggers were discovered during the War of the Ring, when Frodo and three hobbits, en route to Rivendell, fell prey to the Barrow White. Their salvation came in the form of Tom Bombadil, who rescued the hobbits from their imminent demise, unearthing the daggers within the Barrow White's tomb and bestowing them upon the hobbits. These daggers were crafted centuries prior, amid Arnor's decline by the Dunedain for their conflicts against the Witch King of Angmar. The daggers, distinguished by their leaf-shaped blades, serpentine motifs on the hilt, and sheaths composed of an unidentified metal, held an air of ancient significance. The dagger given to Frodo was broken in his hand by an incantation of the Witch King when the hobbit fled through the river gorge to Rivendell. However, Mary's dagger fulfilled its destiny in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, serving as the instrument of the Witch King's demise. 
As the Witch King towered over Eowyn, Mary wielded his dagger to wound the Witch King's foot, providing Eowyn with the opportunity she needed. In fulfilling this purpose, the dagger was vanished. Transitioning to the subject of Witch King, it's worth delving into the dark lore of the Morgul Dagger. These daggers, wielded by the Ring Wraiths, were not designed for conventional warfare, but rather for more insidious purposes. Hence, they were often referred to as Morgul Knives, given their shorter stature relative to a standard dagger. The Morgul Daggers were imbued with potent magic and poison. Upon penetrating the flesh of a victim, the dagger would shatter, leaving a fragment embedded in the victim, while the remaining portion turned to dust. This residual shard would embark on a fatal journey through the victim's body towards the heart. If not promptly removed, it would ultimately transfigure the victim into a wraith. Even if the embedded shard were extracted, the afflicted could not recover through ordinary means and would require the healing prowess of the elves. Conversely, the Athelis plant served as a palliative to the dagger's poison. Upon Frodo's injury by a Morgul dagger on Weathertop, Aragorn utilized this herb as an initial remedy until Elrond eventually cured Frodo of the dagger's lethal effects. Despite this, Frodo would continue to experience a residual piercing pain at the site of the wound on each anniversary of the incident. The Black Arrow, despite being perhaps one of the most underappreciated amongst the famed weapons I've discussed thus far, holds an irrefutable significance. Amidst the spectacular arsenal of Middle-earth, this humble arrow's pivotal role often goes unnoticed, yet its contribution was indeed monumental. On the brink of the War of the Ring, Thorin Oakenshield, accompanied by his band of dwarves and the hobbit Bilbo Baggins, journeyed to the Lonely Mountain. It was here that Thorin's forebears and their people had been expelled by the dragon Smog many years prior. Their mission was to dislodge the dragon and reclaim the kingdom hidden beneath the mountain. A sequence of events led to the dragon vacating the mountain, flying towards Lake Town, whom he suspected of aiding the dwarves in their endeavor, ultimately leading to his downfall. The Black Arrow was the prized possession of Bard the Bowman. As Bard recounted, the arrow was forged in the kingdom beneath the mountain before Smog's arrival and had been bequeathed from father to son over the generations. Every time Bard loosed this arrow, it would unfailingly hit its mark, only to be retrieved by him afterward. As the dragon unleashed his fury upon Lake Town, Bard deployed this last resort arrow, striking the solitary vulnerable spot on the dragon's underbelly, piercing its heart, and bringing about its demise. So, I pose this question, how many weapons in Middle-earth can truly match the critical importance of the Black Arrow? Orchrist and Glamdring. These two swords warrant joint discussion as they were forged together and share a fraternal bond of sorts. Both were crafted by the elves in the clandestine elven kingdom of Gondolin during the First Age of the Sun and were wielded by Gondolin's elite warriors. It is said that these twin swords were responsible for the demise of hundreds of orcs. Orcrist, inscribed with elven runes and boasting a jewel-encrusted hilt, would emit a cold blue light when orcs were in proximity, much like its counterpart, Glamdring. Both swords miraculously survived the downfall of Gondolin, though the specifics of their survival and their eventual arrival at a troll-inhabited cave remain a mystery. Thorin Oakenshield and Gandalf discovered the two swords in the troll cave, with Thorin claiming Orcrist. Upon his examination, Elrond recognized that the swords were the handiwork of the elves of Gondolin, yet chose not to reclaim Orcrist from Thorin. Subsequently, during Thorin's imprisonment in Mirkwood, the dwarf and the sword were forcibly separated. However, following the Battle of the Five Armies and Thorin's demise, Thranduil returned Orchrist and it was interred alongside Thorin, inducing dread in orcs as the Biter. Gandalf took possession of Glamdring, which had been previously used by King Turgon during Gondolin's prime. Similar to Orchrist, Glamdring was adorned with elven runes. Gandalf first brandished Glamdring to slay the Great Goblin. The sight of these blue glowing swords, familiar from legends, sent the orcs fleeing in terror. Glamdring subsequently played a pivotal role in the War of the Ring. Gandalf wielded Glamdring in his duel against the Balrog, from the depths of Moria to its peak. The appearance of Glamdring on the battlefield consistently inspired allies and instilled fear in enemies. This sword, referred to as the Beater by orcs, eventually accompanied Gandalf to the Undying Lands. 
An additional elven weapon, discovered alongside Orchrist and Glamdring in the Troll Cave, was of a smaller stature. While considered a dagger by elven standards, it was more akin to a sword for a hobbit. This blade, too, emitted a cool blue glow when orcs were in the vicinity. This unique weapon came into the possession of the hobbit, Bilbo Baggins. Initially, Bilbo did not give it a name. It was only when he found himself and the dwarves ensnared by spiders in Mirkwood that the sword earned its name. As Bilbo heroically combated the spiders with this blade, he dubbed it Sting. In short order, Sting became a symbol of dread among the spiders, slaying many of them. Upon his return to the Shire, following his adventurous journey, Bilbo brought Sting along, and it eventually found its way into the hands of Frodo. Frodo frequently relied on Sting in his monumental quest to deliver the One Ring to Mordor. In his desperate escape from Shelob's lair, it was Sting that cut through the spiderwebs, a feat that other weapons could not achieve. However, Bilbo and Frodo were not the only hobbits to wield Sting. For a brief period, Sam Gamgee also used it, and it was with Sting that he managed to wound the monstrous spider Shelob, forcing her to retreat. Post the War of the Ring, Sting remained a cherished heirloom in Sam's family. Now we arrive at the two most significant swords of the Second and Third Ages. Though they are, in truth, the same blade, their storied past warrants individual recounting. Narsil was crafted during the First Age of the Sun by Telkar of Nogrod, a dwarf renowned as one of the most skilled blacksmiths of his era. In the Second Age, the sword found itself in the possession of Elros, the first king of Numenor, where it was passed down through generations of his lineage. However, as Numenor fell, Elendil had Narsil in his possession. The exact sequence of events that led Narsil to Elendil remains unclear, but it is likely that he saved this iconic sword, just as he saved the Palantiri, foreseeing the impending downfall. Elendil wielded Narsil in the many battles against Sauron, even taking it into his personal combat with the Dark Lord. During the battle, a fall from a hill resulted in Narsil shattering beneath Elendil's weight. Yet, even in its broken state, Narsil remained consequential. Isildur, Elendil's son, used a shard of the broken sword to sever Sauron's finger and thereby claim the One Ring. Later, during the disaster at the Gladden Fields, Isildur, before his demise, ensured the broken pieces of Narsil were salvaged by entrusting them to a soldier. These fragments eventually reached Elrond. When Isildur's heir, Aragorn, emerged centuries later, the shards of Narsil were reforged by elven smiths and renamed as Anduril, the Flame of the West. Aragorn wielded this renamed sword in battles and potentially used it as a testament to persuade the dead men of Dunharrow. Like Glamdring, Flame of the West instilled courage in allies and fear in enemies whenever it appeared on the battlefield. After Aragorn's passing, Anduril continued to remain within his lineage. So we have covered the most important weapons of the Second and Third Ages of Middle-earth. If I've missed any, please feel free to share them in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to subscribe and give it a thumbs up. Until we meet again, take care and farewell.